Last time I took a look at low voltage operation. Now I want to take a look at low power operation. Kind of think of them going together, but that's not necessarily the case. Just as the low voltage test, there is no voltage regulator on the board, and the only connection to the I.O. pins is the PitKit 5 programmer. Now the power rail on the board does have a few capacitors on it, around 5 microfarad in total, but no other load besides the ATtiny402. The supply voltage is set to 3 volts, and the microcontroller and the PitKit 5 are pulling right at 2.4 milliamps. So that's giving me around a 230 millivolt drop across the meter in the microamp range, about what I would expect, as the current sense resistor for the microamp range measured 100 ohms. For the initial settings, I'm going to set the 32 kHz internal low power oscillator as the main clock source, though I don't think that will matter for this first test. Configuration bits will be left at default, which is disabled for most things. Interrupts are all disabled, not how it would be if I was going to be doing anything useful with the microcontroller. Pins are all at default, I'll come back to that, cause default will be a power draw problem. Under system resources, I will add the sleep controller. I'll turn it on and set the mode to power down, the most extreme setting, almost nothing runs. So for the pins, I'll set them all to inputs. They are set at interrupt disabled, digital input buffer enabled. I'll change all of them to digital input buffer disabled. Like I said, the only thing connected to the microcontroller I.O. pins is the PitKit 5, so most of the pins are just floating, and that won't be good for power draw. I'll generate the code, and then program the microcontroller. Not much extra current during programming, so that's very good. Now to see how much of this 2.4 milliamps is the PitKit 5. Well, almost all of it. So the microcontroller and power down is pulling less than half a microamp, but I have the meter measuring the voltage on the load side of the current measurement, and it has a 10 meg ohm input resistance. Yep, that was 0.3 microamps of the load right there. Here it looks like I have a typical ATtiny402 chip. It's probably pretty close to 25 degrees centigrade in the room. So with the microcontroller doing nothing, there isn't even a clock running. It's pulling around 100 nanoamps. Really, this is at the edge of me being able to measure the actual amount. I think this is a good check though. Now I'm sure I don't have anything wrong that is putting an unexpected load on the power rail. Now having to disconnect the programmer to read the current is not the most convenient thing. Let me see what I can do about that. I don't see why I can't put the PitKit 5's target voltage line before the current measurement. That way only the current going to the board will be measured. The last two header pins on the board are ground and VCC. I will use the ground pin for supply ground. The program header has ground, VCC, and a data line. I'll tie the ground to the ground pin, just so I don't have loose wires hanging around. And I will end up supplying power through the program header. This is my PitKit 5 breakout header. It has all eight wires on it. I'll be using the target voltage, ground, and data line, pins 2, 3, and 4 on the PitKit 5. Ground will get connected to ground, and the PitKit 5 data line will connect to the program header data line but the PitKit 5's target voltage line will not get connected to the program header VCC line. All of the unused lines I'll just insert into the breadboard to keep them from shorting out to anything. Here I'm using a resistor just for its leads. This is the power supply ground and the voltage measuring meter ground lead. Here is the 3 volt supply connection. It is directly connected to the PitKit 5's target voltage line. This is the board's voltage supply. The positive lead of the voltage measuring meter will connect to this, as well as the negative lead of the current measuring meter. And then the positive lead of the current measuring meter will connect to the 3 volt supply. And that should be it. Looks like I have the 0.1 microamps of the microcontroller and the 0.3 microamps of the meter input resistance. Looks like it did a reset of the microcontroller 
At least I think that's what it did. Now I'm not reading the load of the Pitkit 5, so that's an ease of use improvement there. But will it program without any errors? Yes, looks like it did just fine. I'll do a few programs and see what the current looks like. Looks like I saw a 1.6 milliamps, so I'm sure it's pulling a bit more than that. I do have the bypass and filter capacitors on the board. If I look at the data sheet, a race is supposed to be about 1.5 milliamps and write about 3 milliamps. Here I have the scope set to AC input, 50 millivolts of division. I'll program it and that should trigger the scope when the voltage drops. It's across the supply to the board after the current meter, so I have a pretty high impedance voltage supply to the microcontroller. Some of that may be noise from the lights, but it's a pretty ugly looking supply line. I probably should fix a jumper up to jump out the current meter when I go to program the microcontroller. That looks to be enough noise to cause some errors, but again, having to put a jumper in place to program and then remove it, kind of inconvenient. One of the reasons I'm doing these tests at 3 volts is to give me a bit of headroom for the voltage drop from the current meter. But I'll move on and see how much power it takes to actually do something. Looking at the data sheet, I can see that other than programming, the ADC is the most power hungry of the peripherals, so I want to do something with that. I think I'll try turning the microcontroller into a serial output temperature sensor. So the first thing I'm going to do is change the sleep setting from power down to standby. I'm going to do a temperature reading four times a second and I'm going to use the RTC as the clock for timing that. So I'll add the RTC driver. It defaults to enabled, which is what I want. I'll change the clock source from 32 kHz to 1 kHz. Enable the periodic interrupt timer. 1 kHz divided by 256 should give me 4 interrupts per second. And the only interrupt I'm interested in is the periodic timer interrupt. I'm pretty sure the RTC is one of the peripherals that has a run and standby bit, but I don't see an entry for it. Let me take a look at the registers. Should be in the control A register. Yep, it's there, and it's disabled. I guess I'll have to set that manually. That must be an oversight by microchip there. Now I'll add the ADC driver. That includes two peripheral modules, the VREF and the ADC. The voltage reference needs to be set to 1.1 volts for the temperature sensor. The ADC reference enable shouldn't have to be enabled. If it were enabled, the voltage reference would run all the time, and I don't need or want that. I'm going to start the ADC in the disabled state. Since I'm going to be starting and stopping the ADC, there is some startup time involved. So I'm going to set the initial delay to the smallest delay amount, well besides no delay. The input will be the built-in temperature sensor. Reference voltage will be the internal VREF that was set to the 1.1 volts. And I do want to interrupt when the ADC conversion is done. In the ADC section of the data sheet, it says that the minimum ADC clock is 50 kilohertz. The electrical specification section in the data sheet says 100 kilohertz for a VREF of 0.55 volts and 200 kilohertz for a VREF of 1.1 and up. I'm going to be well under the 200 kilohertz, so I might be giving up a bit of accuracy. So the main clock will need to be set to the 20 megahertz internal oscillator. I'm going to set the prescaler to its maximum value of 64. and I'm going to use the 16 MHz clock instead of the 20 MHz clock. As a side note here, setting the 16 MHz value in the clock control section doesn't seem to change the clock frequency, just seems to change the software values. To change to the 16 MHz clock value, 
need to change the setting in the configuration bits window as well. At least that's the only way I've gotten it to work. And now I have a main system clock of 250 kilohertz and that gives me an ADC clock of 125 kilohertz. The last module I need is the USART peripheral. I plan on using the data visualizer data streaming variable option to read the data. I'll disable both the receiver and the transmitter at the start. The receiver I won't be using and I'll be turning the transmitter on and off. The default 9600 baud rate has less than a 0.2% error so I'm going to leave it set to that. And of course the mode is set to 8N1, no reason to change that. So that should be everything that I need. Now unlike the first test that just required one sleep command, this will require a little bit of code. I'm going to open up the MCC generated RTC.C file. I'll look over the initialized settings. And I'd already forgotten there was not a run in standby button. So I'll change the control A register to hex 81. That should allow it to run in the standby mode. I'll do a compile make sure everything is OK before I start cutting and pasting sections. I'll organize the windows a bit, make it not so cluttered. The interrupt I'm using is the RTC PIT vector, so I'll cut it from the RTC.C file and paste it into my main.c file. This interrupt should get called about every 250 milliseconds. It's from here the ADC is turned on and the ADC conversion is started. The ADC is set to run in standby mode? Well, I think I forgot to set that. It will be set to run in standby mode, because once this interrupt returns, the CPU will enter the standby sleep mode. I'll need a variable to hold the ADC result. The MCC gives a warning if two things are using an output pin, so I'll do the output control manually. I'll make sure the USART transmitter is disabled. Set the PA6 output latch to high and set the PA6 direction to be an output. And I will need to enable global interrupts. The other interrupt I'll need is the ADC conversion complete interrupt. I'll go to the ADC0.c file. And sure enough, I forgot to enable the run and standby for the ADC. Let me fix that right now before I forget. There is a button for it in the ADC tab. I just forgot to click it. Generate the code. And now the ADC startup looks like it should. Again, I'll cut the ADC result ready interrupt vector from the ADC0.c file and paste it in the main.c file. Just makes things easier to follow. So the first thing I do is get the ADC result and store it in the 16-bit temperature variable. Then I turn off the ADC. Want to save that power. I'll turn on the USART transmitter here. I don't see a startup time in the data sheet, so it might not need any. The microcontroller has two factory stored values related to the temperature sensor, an offset value and a gain value. Those get read. Then a bit of math to get close to a value in degrees centigrade. And now to send the data to the USART. The data streaming variable frame needs a start byte value of 3. Then the calculated temperature value is sent. And then the data streaming variable frame in byte value of hex FC. Now the USART peripheral doesn't seem to have a run in standby option. If it does, I've missed it. And it does seem to have some quirks to it. Here, after the frame in byte, I disable the transmitter. But it doesn't actually disable itself until all the data in the buffers and shift registers have been sent. That seems reasonable. But I can't let the CPU go to sleep until the transmitter has finished. So really, this section is just wasting power and I may be missing something that would allow the USART to run in standby. 
Another little odd thing is when the transmitter is disabled, it releases the pin control and turns it back over to the port module. But it appears to set the pin to an input and not what it was when it took over control. So I watch for the transmitter to be finished, clear the transmit complete flag, and then set the PA6 port pin back to an output. Then the interrupt returns and the CPU goes back to sleep. Do a compile to check for errors. Looks good. Then I'll program the chip and see what it does. It's bouncing around a lot. I'm sure most of the current is being pulled in a short burst every 250 milliseconds. Looks like the meter is hitting 28 microamps. I'm sure the peak is a bit more than that. Even with a few microfarad on the board, I don't see that being enough to filter out the majority of the current spike. Let me get the data visualizer started up and see if I'm getting any data. 9600 8N1 is the default for the serial port, so that all stays just like it is. I'll add a variable to watch. It's a signed 8-bit integer, which is plenty. The temperature range of the microcontroller is not that much. So there is data there. Let me fix a range for it. It's giving me 23 degrees centigrade. That seems about right. But let me throw some heat on it and see how it responds. I have the hot air set to 400 degrees Fahrenheit, so don't want to overdo it. But yeah, it's reading the temperature. It will take a bit to cool back down, but that seems to be working. I do need to check and see if the temperature I'm getting from the microcontroller is close to what it should be. I'm going to put a bit of thermal tape on the top of the microcontroller and stick a thermocouple to it. Chip is still a little warm from the hot air. I'll let it just set and run some. So it's been around 30 minutes and temps seem to have stabilized. I'm getting a 24 degree reading from the microcontroller and a 23.2 or 0.3 reading from the thermometer. That is really closer than I was expecting. And I could have done a bit better with the math on the Kelvin to centigrade conversion. I thought I would try the scope and see what I could tell about the around 4 millisecond current draw. Here I have the scope on the voltage supply to the test board. It's set to AC and 10 millivolts division and can see the larger current draw at around 250 millisecond intervals. The y-axis cursors are about 27 millivolts apart. So 100 ohms in the microamp range of the meter puts it at say a worst case 300 microamp spike. With all the noise it's hard to tell for sure. It's less than what I was expecting but I'm not that confident in the measurement. Really looks to be a bit over 5 milliseconds in length. A little longer than I figured. But for about 98% of the time, it's maybe pulling a couple of microamps, and for 2% of the time, might hit 300 microamps. What is that, about an 8 microamp average? I'm probably underestimating that, as I don't really know what the off-peak current draw is. So I thought, what I need to get the average is a good filter. I figured I would need better than 10,000 microfarad capacitor to filter out most of the pulse, but it seems 2200 microfarad is the largest I have on hand. So I thought I would give one of those a try. I'll put the meter in the milliamp range and turn on the power supply. That will speed up the charging of the capacitor. Then I'll switch it to the microamp range. And then I'll let it run a bit to see what it stabilizes at. It seemed to stabilize after about 3 to 4 minutes. I'm thinking a 6 microamp average current draw is probably correct. Now this is without the PitKit 5 connected, so there is no load on my temperature serial out data line. Let me get the PitKit 5 hooked up and see what difference that makes. Well, that makes a big difference. I wasn't really expecting the serial data line to put that much of a load on it. That's about 13 microamps just to drive the serial data line on the PitKit 5. There probably is quite a bit of input circuit protection on the line. That may increase its loading effect and it's just the serial data line causing the 13 microamp increase. At these low currents, every little bit of load can make a huge difference in the power consumption. Now, not to overlook the 2200 microfarad capacitor's leakage, it's not too bad. Only around 200 nanoamps. 
Again, not really sure how well the meter is doing at these tiny current levels, but the leakage is not horrible, nor is it zero, but its effect on the average value is not that significant. While I don't think the tiny AVR Zero series would be considered low power, it could do some useful things running off a battery. Reducing the power consumption on any microcontroller is a huge topic, and this little adventure just barely touched the surface of it. Thank you for watching.